So please feel free to get seconds. And also, uh, Bob has a few books here and a few independent reviews of which he edited for many years. So if you want any of his books, they're for free. Please take one or two or three. Uh, Bob is an old buddy of mine. We've been in the world of the same vintage or a similar vintage. And he and I have co-taught at the Mises University many times. I regard him as the preeminent economic historian in the U.S. and a preeminent uh, uh, theoretician of Austrian economics. Bob Hicks. Walter, uh, lovely introduction. I, I always feel like I've been put on the spot when people say such uh, overwhelming things about me. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, I'm not a young man anymore, and uh, that's why I managed to accomplish a few things that I've been at it a long time. Uh, I'm talking to Bill Barnett with Andrew Cohen. And he and I are also of similar vintage and musing about young people we know, young people who are now around 60 years old. <laughs> Some of my best students. That, uh, I always call my voice, but it's getting more and more anomalous to call a 60-year-old my voice. But, uh, that's how it goes. Uh, uh, I'm glad to have a chance to come over here. I, I'm sorry that over the years that I've really been coming to me, which is now 14 years, I've, I've not been able to come over as often as I really wish. But I've been here a number of times before to speak to this group, although we had different membership uh, each time I came. So I'm glad to see the latest cohort of you and uh, to congratulate you on your excellent choice of where to go to school. Especially for students of economics, you can, you can hardly be anywhere better than here. You've got some wonderful faculty members to, to teach you real economics. Uh, most economics departments in this country and the rest of the world teach something they call economics, but it's not. It's, uh, it's like uh, the guy from Prairie Home, home uh, Companion. You know, who does those sunny shows on public radio. Uh, what's his name? Yeah, Keeler. Yeah, Keeler. Keeler was talking about that. He and his group were doing a show somewhere in the south. I don't remember where. But he, was, he, he was going on. You know, they go around and they do, they do these shows in other places outside of St. Paul. And uh, he, he was saying, you know, we'd love to come to the south and do the shows. People are so hospitable, so warm. They're glad to see us. They're so helpful. He says, in Minnesota, he said, that we say we're glad to see you, but we don't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think there's something to that. You know? <laughs> the best humor sometimes has an edge of truth <laughs> to propel it. Uh, anyhow, uh, while I'm here today, I'm going to talk to you about something that I've been uh, thinking about and studying for a long, long time. I started teaching economic history courses in the late 1960s. And I was just you know, not knowing much. Uh, new PhD, rarely know much. And I certainly did. And I was teaching this course in economic history and just sort of walking around through what the textbook said. And, uh, reading sites selected. Uh, time after time there were things that didn't add up, particularly when, when I had an opportunity to study these things myself. It just seemed that every time I really looked into a particular issue, uh, the textbook was really not on target. And, and that happened again and again and again. And one of the places I noticed uh, fairly soon for teaching economic history was the way that World War II was uh, discussed. And uh, eventually, uh, I got around to not only teaching about World War II differently, but to, to writing about it. And, uh, and uh, if you want to actually see more of what uh, I discovered about this, and, and to some extent what other people have discovered.
discovered as well. My, my book, Depression, War, and Cold War, pulled together uh, a number of my journal articles on this subject. They're not technical. Uh, some of them are a little bit technical, but not so much you would understand. But if you want to pursue this subject, you know, here, here's where you look. Uh, a talk can't get you very far. It can only tease you to see if you're interested in that part of it. But if you are interested, uh, check out the first five chapters of <coughs> Depression, War, and Cold War. And you'll find pretty much what I know about this. Uh, at least what I have to add to the discussion. I, I do know a lot of things, but it's mostly facts that everybody knows. Uh, when, when I started reading these textbooks, and, and, and actually just reading in general literature about World War II, I, I was struck right away with how there was an incredible consensus about this horrible set of events, World War II. And the most horrible thing that ever happened in so many ways. 50, 60 million people killed, hundreds of millions of people lost their homes, forced to become refugees. Uh, you name it, it's horrible. World War II has it. It's but the funny thing is that American economists didn't think about World War II as a horrible thing. In fact, they thought about it just the other way around. They thought about it as a wonderful thing. And the remarkable thing to me is that even today, they still think about it the same way. Uh, if you, if you uh, are glutton for punishment and read the Professor Krugman's columns in the New York Times, you'll find a perfect example of someone who espouses vigorously a completely wrong-headed view of World War II, which he calls you know, the greatest public works project in the history of economic policy making. And for him, this was great because the U.S. economy had been in the depression for more than a decade. And even as late as 1940, full recovery had not occurred. Uh, this, was, this was a terrible thing, of course, not in the way that World War II was terrible, but plenty bad enough. Uh, put a lot of people in difficulty uh, making a living. Uh, and young people in particular, people like you who uh, grew up uh, in the 30s, were in the deepest trouble because when unemployment was so great, you know, anytime employers wanted to hire somebody, which was not like an everyday thing uh, in many places for many years, uh, they could probably hire somebody with experience, an older person, you know, they didn't have to take any chances on a young person, whether that person would work out for them or not. And so young people had, had a terrible time getting decent jobs for more than a decade. And they, they had to, to scramble to you know, find ways to get, get through those, those hard times. Now, uh, when the war started, this probably most troubling aspect of the Depression the high unemployment rates and the great uncertainty associated even with employment. If you had a job, you couldn't be sure you were going to keep it. Uh, you might be laid off at any time. Uh, and at, at the worst of the unemployment, around 1932, 34, uh, when about a quarter of the labor force was unemployed, uh, another quarter of the labor force, though employed, was employed only at part-time jobs when they wanted full-time jobs. So either in total unemployment or partial unemployment, you had half of the entire labor force of the United States for years on end. And then 32, 34 period, and it wasn't that much better uh, in the years just before or for a number of years afterwards. A little better, but still bad. Now, World War II came along, and unemployment just disappeared. And when I say disappeared, I mean, if you wanted a job from 1942 to 45, you had one just by walking in and saying, here I am, I want a job. Uh, 
uh, because the employers were so desperate to, to hire <coughs> workers that they began to hire on a massive scale people that they would not even have considered for employment before. But usually people who had no experience, who had no skills of the kind they needed to, to have filled for a particular job. So, but during the war years, employers would hire uh, women who had never been in the paid labor force before, who never worked outside the home. Uh, they hired millions of women uh, for jobs, you know, like women who weren't normally doing it all, like welding or you know, doing tool and die work or, or you know, doing all kinds of factory work that, that had never been done by women. So they, they hired all these women, and of course they hired millions of women for uh, jobs like the secretarial work and so forth. And one, one of the aspects of World War II is it, it was a tremendously well documented war. Uh, anything that had to do with defense contracts or defense work involved forms filled out in eight copies. <laughs> and that, that, that meant a lot of car carbon paper in those days. <laughs> and people who could type so well they didn't make a lot of mistakes that had to be tediously repaired uh, in the old-fashioned way. You can thank your lucky stars for all that they ever, ever had to fool with because of technological change uh, during your career. But anyhow, many women were hired, young people who normally would have been considered too young, uh, <coughs> high school dropouts. Kids looked around and said, you know, I'm not going to stay in school. I'm 16 years old. I can get a well-paying job. They quit school and work. Uh, older people who had given up finding a job were retired. Decided, hey, I'm going back to work because I can walk into this employment place, easy to get a job, and, uh, and they'll hire me even though I'm 65, 70 years old. They don't care, especially if I've done this job before. So the massive unemployment disappeared. All the anxieties associated with mass unemployment disappeared. And, and that's what people mean when they say, as nearly all economists have been saying ever since, the war got the economy out of the depression. They're talking about the disappearance of mass unemployment. And when they talk about that way, they're understanding unemployment and unemployment in the same terms that they understood it at some time before the war, such as during the depression, or sometime after the war. They're thinking, we have a theory of labor markets or in macroeconomics, we have theories that connect labor markets with markets for output and uh, other uh, productive inputs in, in the production process. We have all these ways of understanding uh, employment and unemployment, and we'll apply them just as we go through history. But the same models, the same theories that we apply to understand pre-war years and post-war years will, of course, apply to war years as well. And that's where they went terribly wrong. That's where they completely missed the boat. Because those models presuppose something about how markets work, how a market economy works. And during the war, the U.S. was not a market economy. That doesn't mean there were no markets. That doesn't mean that, that General Motors didn't hire people and pay them from General Motors' bank account and so forth. It looked as if markets were working in many ways, but they weren't free anymore. In fact, General Motors, which I just pulled out of the air as an example, wasn't even free to make the products it wanted to make. When the factories at GM were humming in the spring of 1942, which was something they hadn't done since the 1920s. Business was booming for the car companies, and that industry was, in those days, the biggest industry in America, the automobile industry. But the government just told them they had to stop making civilian automobiles after March 1942. It just ordered them, and it had the authority to order them to do that under legislation that had been passed 
in December 1941 uh, and uh, January 1942. Emergency Powers Act, these things were called. If you go back and read them, or even read in my work about them, you can see that they gave essentially total power to the president <coughs> and his subordinates over economic affairs in the United States. The government could order you what to produce, it could order you what not to produce, it could determine whether you got access to any materials or resources or labor. Uh, it had complete control. Now, then it walked through the motions of thinking you're still a private firm. It's just you were subject to all these restrictions. <laughs> but if you're subject to restrictions as to what you can make, how much you can charge for it, to whom you can sell it, and so forth. You're not a private firm anymore. You're an office of the government <coughs> that's still allowed to earn what is shown in the account books as private profits and to distribute dividends even to shareholders. This 